Hassan, I heard a couple of things from our discussion today. Um, you know, one that sticks out is when you trust people, they will deliver. Uh, you create a budget for what matters. I really, you know, I really like that. Uh, having it's required that you have confidence to stay positive uh, or have the confidence to stay positive. Uh, communicate purpose by action. I think a lot of purpose is spoken and not not actioned. And I like what you just said now around uh, by being loud, you're being seen. And when you're seen, people will approach you. Welcome to another episode of Talks with T. Uh, I'm honored today to have, uh, I think I can say you're a LinkedIn celebrity at this stage. Uh, no, celebrity is, is overrated. <laughs> Contributor, I call Contributor, myself. Contributor, uh, wisdom provider. Somehow. Um, Hassan, a, a realist. Realist. Yeah. Uh, Hassan Wahibe, uh, founder of Plugmina. Um, I'd love for you to just tell our audience about Plugmina uh, and how you actually got started uh, with the company itself. Plugmina has been always uh, maybe a dream, if you can say that. Mm. Uh, I started this company around six months back after I just uh, graduated from the corporate world. Uh, it's basically some kind of the way you change advisory is being done mm. and not consultancy. I talk when I say advisory, it means practical advisory. It means when you plug yourself with companies, organizations, executives, startups, where they really need help and not only advisory and uh, grabbing your knowledge and experience, but also execution. Mm. Today, the concept of advisory and consultancy is much more of PowerPoints. And, yeah, you know, theoretical. Theoretical, and nobody executes. Uh, so I wanted to try this concept uh, to leverage on my personal experience and knowledge because I've faced this in the past. I mm. always wanted advisors or consultants who can really help us in executing things from a very experienced point of view, not only theory and based on research and everything. Yeah. Although this is important, yeah. but the real practical experience is very much needed. So I opened it, I focus a lot on logistics, last mile, e-commerce, because this is the trend now, yeah. and startups. I help startups a lot. I plug myself as like a co-founder with mm -hmm. them. Uh, most of them are coming from the corporate background. They're so good, but they need a helping hand mm. uh, with others. So that's it in a nutshell. Okay. And you see it's called advisory and beyond. Mm. What we do in Plugbean is everything else, which mm. I didn't mention now as well. Nice. You're a Aramex veteran to a large extent. Yeah, I mean, I graduated from Aramex. It yeah. was my first job. Uh, I learned a lot. Aramex is a school. Mm. Let's be realistic. Mm. Uh, the way it it was established and the way it grew and the way it became a big multinational is a big story. Mm. So myself and everybody who graduated from Aramex or whoever is still there, uh, we have a unique uh, thing which maybe you cannot find anywhere else uh, when it comes to corporate culture, when mm. it comes to how really when a company is run like a family atmosphere, full of empowerment uh, with a strong brand, how this really makes a big difference. So I can tell you that my experience, my major experience is from there. Yeah. I can imagine, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that kind of cor that f emphasis on corporate culture in this part of the world was probably very different than, than it is today. And so a place like Aramex probably stood out massively versus the rest of the companies that were built in the region? Well, uh, look, it go, all goes to the foundation of the company. Mm. From day one, uh, the founders have set a very strong foundation uh, whereby I never went to work uh, in Adamex. Mm. I used to go, uh, uh, I mean, I didn't have that feeling of, oh my God, I'm going to work in the morning. Yeah. You know, it was more of, uh, uh, you're going to really add value to an industry, to a company, to a big organization where you know everyone inside. Uh, empowerment was the name of the game. Mm. And of course, uh, uh, the corporate culture played a very big role in making this thing uh, happen. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why do you think you didn't feel like you were going to work every day? I can tell you because of the leadership that I had personally mm. at that time. So I was being led by great, leader, great leaders. And as I told you, the foundation of the company, the culture from day one was embedded in a way that uh, 
they want you to feel as if you're part of the company. Mm. You you fall into the DNA of the company and you work every day as if it's your own. Mm. When you work as if it's your own and you take it personal, when things go wrong, then this is where perfection starts to happen. No. And you grew quite rapidly, actually, within within the ranks of Aramax. I can I can call myself a bit of a lucky person, mm. uh, but uh, I give the credit not to myself, to the team. Mm. I couldn't have grown that quick uh, in any company uh, without the support of the team. So it's because of my team or, or the team who worked with me, because I hate the word my team. Mm. Uh, I was able to grow, and of course, I was able to grow people with me as well. It was never about me; it was about everybody as uh, as one hand. Mm. What do you uh, along the way? What did you learn about leadership as you scaled your own skill set? I learned that leadership is not really. Uh, uh, I mean, it's more of an inspiration. Mm. It's not just leading people or managing people, micromanaging people, questioning people. It's much more of inspiring people, working with them. Forget about the titles. I hate titles. Mm. Uh, it was more of working as one team. Uh, okay, titles are important, maybe as part of the structure. Mm. But in principle, I was always on the ground. I was never in the office. Mm. You have to be in the office sometimes. Yeah. But as in principle, I was with my people on the ground, visiting clients. I still do it till today. I visit clients, uh, even my clients today. I do sales. Uh, I take complaints from clients. Uh, and of course, I work on the internal culture whereby your internal clients who are your employees uh, need to be motivated, empowered, uh, while keeping, of course, that small touch of, uh, I'm not going to say strictness, but sometimes you have to be a bit tightening the belt. Accountability. And accountability mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. so that you can build a very high performing corporate culture mm-hmm. while, allow- while allowing people to really perform while they're happy. Yeah. Some people will tell you you're not in the business of making people happy. Yes, you are. Mm. If you're not happy at work, you will not perform. Yeah, hundred percent. How do you find that balance? It's simple. It's it's all about you as as a leader. It's mm. embedded in you, number one. It's your character, and it's the culture itself. Mm. What does it encourage? Does it encourage a toxic environment? If it does, then you are in the wrong place. Yeah. And yourself as an empathetic leader, a servant leader because you know servant leadership Mm -hmm. is very important if you don't have the this in your dna as a leader you will fail and you cannot survive in a toxic culture so either you battle that toxic culture kill it and build a new one or you just leave Mm -hmm. you cannot change it that easily unless you are the decision maker you are the captain of the ship i always say Mm -hmm. the easiest thing ever is to disinfect Mm -hmm. a corporate culture from a toxic environment, but it needs some courage and power by the captain of the ship himself or herself. Mm. It takes a decision, and I think execution is very simple. Yeah. And how do you find the balance between creating a culture of openness but accountability? You know, from my experience, uh, I'm fully subscribed to what you're saying. It took me a while to figure out how to balance both. So being in a place that's high performing, high expectations, while also making sure that people are enjoying themselves along the way. And that took me a, a little bit of time to figure out how to balance it. Tarek, when you trust people, mm. trust me, they will they will deliver. Mm. When you have people whom you trust, they will deliver. Yeah. Be it uh, they're very happy or not. You, I mean, you're not in the business of stressing people. In the end, people do not work for you. Yeah. People work with you. Uh, this is a fact, whether we like it or not. That's an actual fact. So when you work all for one purpose, they know what they need to do. You give them the tools, you empower them. While setting uh, the, I mean, the corporate rules, which nobody can really violate, Mm -hmm. but sometimes you can really step out of the book. You Mm -hmm. don't have to follow the book point by point as long as you are compliant. Uh, What do you mean by that, step out of the book? Well, you can always have something called exceptions. Yeah. Uh, especially when it comes to customer facing decisions. Mm. Uh, let's say in our business, for example, if you lose a parcel, the compensation is $100. Mm. What if you've shipped something very expensive and very valuable to a client and the shipment was lost? Mm. Sometimes you have to compensate. You mm. have to have the power to say, you know what, I'm going to break that rule of paying you $100. I'm going to pay you the full amount. 
of the product or sometimes I'm going to give you a discount on future shipments just to make sure that logically logically uh, you find a solution mm-hmm. and that's a, that's a very small example yeah. Um, sometimes you need to take decisions when it comes to no budget. I hate this word, no mm, budget. Mm. There's nothing called no budget. Mm. There's always, uh, you can say, you can create a budget for whatever matters. Mm. The word budget, you create a budget. And a budget is just like limiting yourself what you can spend on. But when you have to spend extra on your people, on your clients, on anything that adds value to the business, then do it. One you know, one impression I have of you, um, we don't know each other that well at this stage, but one impression I have of you is you're very switched on. You're very go-getter, boom, 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 boom. We're just actually talking about it this morning. Where does that come from? It is a tricky question. This is all self-generated positive energy. Uh, It came from a mix of experiences between hardship and the opposite of, uh, of hardship. Mm. Uh, it's a character in me. Uh, mm. Sometimes it backfires on me uh, because it exhausts you physically. Mentally, it never because it keeps you always on your feet. Mm. I'm a person uh, who doesn't like bureaucracy. I don't like things to be delayed. I like immediate decision making. Uh, sometimes I take calculated risks. Uh, but in principle, whatever should happen, should happen now. Why should you delay things, take the decision and move on? So this comes from a mix of many things. But as I told you, I never expect people to motivate me or to tap on my shoulder or to tell me a good job. I do it for myself. Mm. And this is where self-motivation comes. And self-motivation is a pure outcome of a self-generated positive energy, as I told you, which keeps keeps me on my feet every single day. I mean, today I have seven meetings. I'll, I'll be running after your podcast to another six meetings, and I'm happy about it. So it's all from within. Yeah. And because I'm going to meet people, people are always my source of, of energy. So mm-hmm. Whoever I'm meeting, uh, I look forward to meet that person. So this is where I keep running. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, one thing that has become clear over the course of doing this is that there's some perception that people are born this way or some people are always going, going, and some people are not. The one thing I've noticed is there's a commonality, if you want to call it, of many entrepreneurs or people in general have faced hardships and they made a decision on what to do at that point. And that the way they reacted to that really defined them and led them down this path. And so you said hardships, I guess, anything you'd be willing to share in terms of hardships that stick out in your memory that really you feel shaped you the way you are today? Yes, uh, many situations. Uh, uh, what what re- the real hardship for me was trust. Mm. Uh, when it comes to how I was being led, mm. I didn't have any problems. And most of the businesses I led, I was very, very lucky to have good leaders. So uh, that stress of What should I do? I have a bad boss. I have bad uh, people above me. It wasn't the situation. It was more of the trust, which was a bit uh, disappointed me. I trusted many people. And uh, that trust turned into disasters for me sometimes. So this is where, uh, when I tell you hardship, I mean, I learned from my lessons. And today, uh, what I'm trying to do is, and, and you notice I'm very loud about very taboo topics, Mm. of course, in a professional manner and in a positive manner. But I want people to learn from my own mistakes rather than waiting to learn from their own. Mm. So uh, I learned that, yes, you cannot trust everyone. And even if you want to trust anyone, and you can trust people, of course, you have to be very careful in trusting people. It's never a one-way thing. It's a two-way thing. Either it's a win-win or it should never happen. Is there a story that comes to mind? I mean, no need to throw anybody under the bus, but a story that Uh, kind of comes to mind. I have a lot of stories, uh, but uh, it's much better not to mention them here Mm. because uh, I don't want to, again, uh, spill any negative vibes. Yeah. uh, But across my path, and people will learn from what 
what mm. you wanted to extract mm. now from me on this mm. podcast mm. Mm. as stories will be always taught to people in a practical manner. Yeah. And that's what I do, by the way, in my yeah. business. Yeah. Yeah. Today, when I advise companies and people, I advise them based on my raw experience. Yeah. Don't do that because it happened with me in the past mm. and I prove it to them. Mm. You said, you know, an example of some of the hardships were things around learning the hard way around trust. And then earlier you said, when you trust people, they will deliver. So how do you find that balance? Trusting when it comes to when you are a leader and you trust your people, mm. that's a different topic completely. Got you. That trust goes more from trusting their capabilities, trusting their abilities, and that they can run the world. What mm. I'm talking about is more of the bigger picture. When you trust individuals uh, for something that can really affect your destiny. Got it. For something that can affect your uh, career path uh, and, and so on. So it's more of in the business transactions, mm, mm. Uh, be it maybe in any business which you're going to do a partnership with people, be it maybe when you are hired for a specific mm. task or opportunity, mm. and how honest people were with, you, were with you from day one about that opportunity, uh, rather than seeming like an opportunity but ending up like uh, a big issue. Yeah. So in principle, uh, I think here what, what really steps in between trust and lack of trust is selfishness. Mm. Uh, you will you will face people in life whereby they come to you, sugarcoat everything, make the world great for you, but in the, in the back of their head, they want their own benefit. Mm. They don't care what happens to you. Mm. They don't care what happens to everybody around you. And this thing you will learn it in life. And you will, you will be able to spot such people from the first five minutes you sit with them. No. Uh, that's why today, psychologically, I consider myself a bit a bit smart when it mm. comes to analyzing you mm. from the first five minutes. Mm. Are you a person who's trustworthy to make business with or no? Maybe I, I learned this again because of a lot of examples, mm. but in principle, it's working. Yeah. So nine out of ten uh, appear to be like I see them. Yeah, good ratio. That's a good ratio. Yeah. You said pos- you, positive energy came up a lot. How do you prime yourself for positivity? There's so many things on a daily basis that could lead someone to feel negative or let's just say less than positive even. What do you do to prime yourself, if anything at all? I posted two days back something. I spoke about this. And that's a very good example, I will say. You cannot try to solve an algebra equation by chewing a bubble gum, mm. which means things go wrong. Mm. If I keep worrying about things that are going wrong, I'm not going to solve the problem. Mm. So I learned that by sitting, isolating myself, being negative about things will make things worse. So today, everything that comes to my way, whatever it is, personal, business, general, I just step on the negativity and move forward. Mm. And the moment I step away from negative people, trust me, it works. Mm. Does it need Courage? No. I can tell you it needs confidence. When you're confident enough, you know that negativity is not going to help you. Negativity is going to affect everybody around you. You take a personal decision to pollute. I call myself a polluter. You pollute people around you with positive energy and uh, the outcome is always positive. I can tell you, guaranteed, under my own personal responsibility, it's going to be always positive. So, that's the only pill I take every day morning, the pill of positivity. Mm. I think it's, uh, I like that you said it's confidence. I think it's also to a certain extent a choice, right? People don't, people don't realize that I have a choice to be positive. I have a choice to be negative. I think a lot of people get caught up in this cycle that, oh, this is what's happening to me. And this is, this is why I feel this way. Uh, and I remember reading something that really stuck with me. It said, you know, there's there's a, kind of a cycle of execute, feel, and be motivated or inspired, right? That's kind of a cycle. And the reality is you can jump in anywhere in that any of those steps and go through that same cycle. So a, a simple example is, I'll take this morning. I did not feel like going to the gym at all. Like everything in, in my head was today, take a pass, don't go today. 
And then 20 minutes into the workout, I just, something switched on in my head and I really went into it for the last, you know, 20 minutes. And my point is making that choice to just show up ended up having the impact of making me feel positive, motivating me to continue through my day in the right way. And so I think a big part of it's also choice. 100%. And the positive energy, it gives you fuel. Mm. It gives you fuel to perform. Uh, people feed you. Yeah. Um, when you sit with people, you, you don't have to be a selfish person. I'm one of the people when I'm down, yeah. and of course I'm sometimes down. Yeah. You see me positive, yeah. but I have my, my moments. Everyone has their moments. Of course, I stay at home. Yeah. I just stay at home. I don't engage with people. Mm. It's better not to affect others around you. It can be a day or two, uh, but then you will rebound by yourself. Mm. Uh, so it's good sometimes to be down because when you're down, you will have time to sit and assess what's going around you, mm. what made you all down. But you cannot stay like that. Mm. It's a human nature. Some mm. people hate themselves. Mm. Uh, let's be realistic. Mm. If, if you hate yourself, you will hate everybody around you. Mm. You will not really look into adding value to people around you. You'd be very selfish. And you cannot avoid such people because there are such people and they have their reasons and I totally understand. So I never come and tell someone you're not good because you're negative. No. The first thing I do is I try to know why he or she are negative. I yeah. try to help them. Maybe they need help. Uh, but if you try to help them and they just even reject your help, then it's their problem sometimes. Yeah, yeah 100%. Uh, and, you know, I think to to a large extent, uh, the the positivity thing you, you mentioned, sometimes it gets tiring. Uh, oh, yes. just, and so I can relate to that. So I just wanted to get your... I wanted to learn from you. What have you figured out about? I'll tell you that the penalty of being always positive yeah. and uh, uh, being that energetic, uh, people, some, some people try to, uh, I'm not going to say abuse, you know, I don't like this word, but uh, you, will have, you will attract a lot of people around you who need to be uh, engaged with you somehow. And they want to take part of that energy, extract it to them, uh, while you really can't do it for a lot of people. Um, when you learn how to say no sometimes, it helps you a lot. But when you're very positive, it's very tough to say no. I have this problem. M many people approach me for very small things, mm. which when you say time is money, yes, time is money. And now because I'm on, I'm on my own, I'm trying to build my business, uh, I have to benefit financially. I started to sometimes apologize for let's say engagements or meetings that are not work related. Although I try to push them to the weekend, but sometimes, you know, weekend is for the family. Yeah. So to balance between this and this is a bit tough. Mm. So being very positive will attract a lot of people to you. Mm. You may need, you may disappoint some of them and this is the painful point. Mm. Uh, are you being very nice? No. Uh, look, there is something I say, being nice, being positive and having empathy is never a weakness. Mm. The real weakness, I always say this, doesn't exist in, uh, the, sorry, the real strength, which doesn't exist in weak leaders is empathy, mm. is being good. Mm. So you have to be good, but you have to be as well balancing how to be good so that people will not abuse you and so that you don't do anything wrong by just, you know, losing the ends of the way you react with people and the way you act with people. So you have to balance, but in principle, all this positivity takes the the bigger part of the scale, as we say. Yeah. What led you to think about leaving Aramax after having spent so much time there? I look at the people who think it's sponsored uh, this <laughs> event. Uh, Aramax yeah. is one of the companies which, yeah. as I told you, I worked in. I worked in many other companies. Yeah. Uh, Let me rephrase my question. Why did you decide to go into the entrepreneurial startup ecosystem? Uh, before that, I went to uh, to the government okay. after uh, Aramex. Uh, okay. You know, there's always an end for a journey and you have to move forward mm. for a reason or another, mm. of course, uh, in, in a very positive manner. Uh, staying in one company for a very long time keeps you in the comfort zone. Mm. Although you'll be happy, everything you want is there, you're growing, but you need to see the external world as well. And I think when I started to move my career a little bit, I saw the real opportunities uh, outside. 
you, you cannot see everything outside when you're really deep inside yeah. uh, for a long term. Maybe I decided to retire at that time uh, at one company, but circumstances um, encouraged me to to change my path, and I went to the public sector, to the government. Mm. And that was the biggest achievement for me, self-achievement I've ever done. I never understood about the public sector. Uh, when I joined the UE government here as an advisor in the prime minister's office, it was the best experience ever. It really gave nice. me a, a great perception of how the public sector operates, mm. how the country functions, and the mindset of the public sector. Because in other countries, yeah. it's different. Yeah. Here, um, and funnily, or not funnily, realistically, the public sector, as per my personal experience, and that's my personal opinion, is 10 times faster than the private sector. Oh, wow. Believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The way we used to run, the way we used to run initiatives and projects, and everything with a deadline, and every deadline has a purpose. Mm. And every purpose has an impact on the ground. Mm. So this is the beauty of working in the government here. And till today, it's even developing and emerging. Uh, that gave me a great perception of how to balance between private and public sector and then of course i joined other two companies and then i went on my own mm. so what, i what, what did you learn from the working in the government uh, that you carry with you till today that not everything is about money mm. in the government of course i was an advisor i was getting paid as a full-time employee mm. but it was never about money for me it mm. was about the impact I was one of maybe hundreds of thousands of people working in the government. Each and every one of us, if you have a 0.01% positive impact on the community, mm. on the country which embraced you, which which welcomed us from day one as expats and we became part of the texture, mm. texture then you need to give back. And giving back usually is not happening just because you're getting paid. So what I learned in the government is, and then when I went back to the private sector, to mm. other companies, I was so strict when it comes to ensuring that any company I lead will have to leave a positive impact in the community. Mm. In our industry delivery, mm. I was super strict when it comes to delivery performance because I want people to come to the UAE and say, wow, there are great service levels. Mm. So as a private sector company in the delivery, I have to contribute in elevating the service levels. Mm. And it was a psychological thing. Although in the company itself, it's a strategy, it's a KPI to have a good delivery performance. Mm. But for me, as Hussein, because I worked in the government, it was also a commitment that I have to ensure that this country and any other country in the region uh, gets a good service levels. And mm. it's my responsibility as a leader to lead a company that provides good service to elevate the general mm. service levels. Mm. Uh, so it kind of give you a purpose almost. That's 100%, bigger. 100%, 100%. And how, how do you, from your experience, how do you infect team members with purpose that's bigger than just things around money, business performance? Is it Does it even matter to have a purpose being felt at all levels in the company? You can do it. It depends, again, on the CEO of the company. Mm. But you cannot outsource these things. Mm. You cannot outsource communicating purpose, you cannot outsource communicating the values of the company, and you cannot outsource leading by example. That's mm. very important. Mm. So when I say the CEO, yes, the top person or the person who's on the top of the company is the one and the only one who can drive that. And then the people below you, the executive team will execute and, and, and follow your steps to take it across the layers downwards. Uh, the way I used to do it, I used to communicate with people. I never had layers. Uh, I was always having an open door policy. I had a PA in some companies just to arrange my travels, to arrange my schedules, but not to really close the doors. Mm. You don't need an appointment to see usually a leader. So by having this two-way communication with people while in the office or being in the field, also with the field people, I think you can communicate the purpose by action. Mm. And when they see you, what you do, literally, they will follow your steps. Mm. And and you know what I learned, Tariq? I hate the word leading by fear. Mm. I just cannot stand seeing leaders or, or managers uh, using fear, a fearful style uh, to drive performance. It doesn't work. 
I use the embarrassment type, which means if you are working with me, instead of shouting on you or firing you, firing you or threatening you, threatening you, if you don't perform, I'll tell you, don't disappoint me. Mm. I trust you. I gave you all the power. I empowered you. If you don't perform, it will backfire on me because I trusted you. Mm. I always use this as a natural way of leading mm. and it works mm. because trust me, I had many people who came and submitted their resignation on my table mm. because they couldn't perform. Mm. And they said, saying, we don't want to disappoint you. You trusted us. You gave us everything, but we're not able to perform. Mm. Maybe it's the wrong place for us. Mm. So instead of waiting for the HR to come and give them a warning memo or you know, asking them to leave, they do it themselves. Yeah. So leading people by making them feel, they have to feel that if they're not performing, they have to improve. We try to help them improve. If we fail and they fail, it's better for them to migrate to somewhere else mm. in a very good manner, in a yeah. positive manner. Yeah. And so you're now in this uh, very different e ecosystem versus corporate public sector. What drove you what gave you the conviction that it was time to get into the let's call it entrepreneurial startup space i always wanted to be on my own mm. uh, i said i now have enough ingredients and tools to go on my own uh, my business doesn't require investments mm. i'm not running after fundraising mm. it's more of a, a unique business model which as i told you i leverage on my personal network experience mm. and knowledge and I know that I can control what I deliver. Mm. And when I commit, I deliver. Mm. When I promise, I deliver. Nothing can stop me from that. But I used to mentor a lot of startups across my career. And I was always inspired by the way uh, they enjoyed the challenge. Mm. A startup is not as easy as you think. It's mm. a big challenge. But <laughs> it's a tough one. Tough one, but there's a, there's a sweet taste in that toughness. You know? yeah. And as long as you know what you're doing, uh, you will always have business. Uh, it gets tougher if you are fundraising, you know, because it's all about money. And if you don't get enough money, you can't uh, survive. But today also, other than Plugmina, I'm getting back into somehow the corporate uh, through being a co-founder of something really big, mm. really big, mm, uh, mm, which we're mm, building now. Mm. Uh, maybe I'll give you a scoop in the future. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I'm going back into the corporate while keeping Plugbean, of mm, course, mm, mm. Uh, as a co-founder of something which we're building from scratch. Mm. So I'm between a startup and a light corporate structure, which is going to be uh, seeing the light soon. But we are building this business based on a startup mindset. Mm. And it's going to run based on a startup mindset. Mm. It's going to grow and scale based on a startup mindset. Mm. I don't see this company or any company I have built in the future or any company I may lead in the future is going to work in the rigid corporate style. People mm. don't want this anymore. Mm. It doesn't work, Tariq. Mm. You still have this, but it, the, the, the generation of people today whom you'd want to attract to work with you are different. Mm. They cannot work from eight to five. They cannot be asked, what time are you coming to the office? Yeah. They cannot in be some called, cases, they can't even be asked to come to the office every taba, day. Yeah. Taba. And yeah. you know, some of them don't even like from you to follow up with them on a Saturday mm. about work related. Mm. And they have the right to do mm. that. Mm. So you need to change the way you, you run companies today. Uh, the corporate uh, DNA should always be there when it comes again to compliance, corporate governance, and these things that keep a company. Uh, in a solid uh, situation, but also when it comes to people, uh, empowerment, uh, trusting people, balancing between their work-life balance is a big debate. We need mm. a different episode for this. Mm. Do I believe in it? Yes. Mm. But when you are a startup, it's a choice. Mm. When you work in the corporate, it's not a choice. Mm. Uh, you cannot really buy your own uh, time, uh, your own convenience, because you have people above you. Mm. who are trying to put pressure on you or some people, good leaders who, who understand your situation. Mm. Me, luckily, in all the companies when I had leaders above me, I had great leaders who used to apologize for me mm. if they called me on weekend. Mm. If I was on leave, the first thing I used to hear is, sorry, Hussein, we know you're on leave. 
but there's something urgent if you can help us in. And mm. this is something I really appreciate. Mm. And this is where we learned how to lead people. I always say, Tariq, the way me or any of my colleagues lead our people today is in the same way we were led. Mm. Look sure. at those people who, who carry heavy titles or titles bigger than them. And they were led by arrogant managers and toxic managers. They will do the same with their people. 100%. It's, they, like, they a, just, it's like a they child just, and their, fo- uh, their exactly. parents seeing. Maybe they, re- they, they take revenge of people. Yeah. I was led in a bad way. I need to lead people in a, ba- in a bad way. Such people should be always identified yeah. and given, as I say, a farewell. Yeah. To for them, a beautiful farewell, yeah. a memorable one, yeah. because you don't need them. You yeah. just don't need them. Yeah. Having spent a lot of time with entrepreneurs now in this new chapter, what have you learned from being around entrepreneurs? I learned uh, resilience is the biggest thing I'm learning. Never give up. Nothing happens in one day. And business doesn't come to you. Mm. You have to run after opportunities. Uh, You cannot set up your own business and just wait for the business to rain on you. You have to utilize all your network experience. That you have two types of entrepreneurs today. The ones who come from the corporate, top people. Mm. I mean, they have a history better than anybody else. And they go back and start from scratch. They remove their ties, they remove their suits, and they build while running their sleeves. These people are succeeding. And especially when they come from um, a diversified corporate experience. And the other part, and who are struggling today, and in my company, I help them, by the way. Mm. The founders who are super technical, super smart, but they don't have the commercial, uh, uh, they're not really good in sales. Mm. They're not really good in building teams, but they're good in building the product. They're good in building the company. Mm. Uh, So you help them in opening the network, utilizing their network of people and contacts to get business to grow their business to promote their business you as a founder and that's what i've seen today you have part of them who are very loud about their brand and Mm. people know this be more than me today yeah but some of them don't amplify their brand and Mm. this is wrong Mm. your brand is your company and your company is your brand so your personal brand should be always embedded in your corporate brand and you have to promote it because Mm. if you don't do it uh, nobody else will do it for you Mm. so I think the best combination of co-founders when it comes to building a company is you get tech-focused people, you get people-focused people, uh, and you get commercially-focused people. So when you have these three as three co-founders, each one of them will play his or her role. But in the end, no matter what, everybody sells. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To say, if you're sitting with someone, pitch your business. Yeah, 100%. 100%. The word confidence came up a few times in our discussion. It probably comes easier for some people than others. Uh, I see sometimes people have this feeling of um, what you call imposter syndrome. So I have a a role to do. I have a title. I have a task. I have an objective. I have a mission. And then self-talk starts to settle in. Can I do it? What if people find out I'm not good enough to execute this? And so I think confidence comes easier for some people than others. And so what have you learned about building confidence? Confidence cannot be taught. It's built in in you. It grows with you uh, the more you learn from from life. Um, For me, confidence, my confidence, it's I can tell you that I reached maybe the ultimate level of confidence. Uh, when it comes to not fearing people, not worrying about what people will say. And by fearing and being scared about my reputation, which is the most important thing for me, and that's my asset, Mm. then my confidence is going to triple always. When you stop really being afraid of people, you will have the right confidence. Mm. That's because nothing will scare you. Mm. Any problem, any disaster, anything that comes your way, which is bad, is from human beings. Mm. Learn how not to fear human beings. Learn how to be confident and you can confront anyone in front of you with full confidence without really worrying about what they will think about you. Mm. For me, I don't care about if I'm sitting with a top person 
with the number person, number one person in the world, or a very small junior person. I treat both the same, and I force them to respect me and treat me in the same way. Mm. So uh, you have to earn respect. If you're sitting, many times when I was in junior uh, levels, I used to sit with people and then the guy in front of me tells me, you know who you're sitting with? I'm the CEO of X or I'm the, yeah. okay, so what? Yeah. And I'm nothing. So when you know how to deal with such people, instead of really allowing them to scare you or make you worry or hesitate and what you were the, you are there for, mm. you will have that confidence. And the moment you have it, you will enjoy, trust me. Mm. you will enjoy getting into trouble. <laughs> when I say getting into trouble, not from your side. Yeah. Uh, I mean, today I tell many people, I hear stories about very bad uh, managers and bosses and some of them abuse. Mm. So I come and tell you, Tariq, for God's sake, please, mm. can you meet? Can I meet your boss? Mm. Can I meet that person who's abusing you? Mm. You sit aside and let me handle the conversation. Mm. So you throw yourself into such things. Yeah. To, to correct things and maybe show that person that what you're doing is not good. Mm. Somebody should speak about it. Mm. Somebody mm. should speak about mm. those issues. Mm. So maybe I have this today and uh, and it's uh, people accept it. So what drove you to become more active, more vocal on the social media side? Uh, the, um, I have the passion of sharing knowledge and experience. Mm. Uh, I like to really as I told you in the beginning of this episode, to let people learn from my mistakes mm. and as well see the opportunities from my own perspective. When mm. I see an opportunity, it's not only for me. It mm. can be for me and for everybody else. And that's why under Plugmina, Plugmina is an ecosystem today. You see, I'm not hiring people. I don't have employees. Mm. Everybody who works with me, I plug in partners so that we can benefit all together. Mm. So by being loud, you're being seen. Mm. And by being seen, you're being approached for business, you're being approached for support, you're being approached for, for anything else. There's no value in being offline. When you are offline, when you're silent, nobody will hear you. So if you ask me what's the benefit of uh, being loud, I can give you 500 benefits today. But of course, you have to be loud in a balanced manner. You just and consistently, of course, consistent. Of course. That's that's what kills me is the consistency aspect. I don't have the, I haven't built the muscle or the discipline yet to every have day. That consistency. I I do every day. I'm I'm very active every day, once or twice. Mm. I never have a problem in creating content. I yeah. always have content. I yeah. mean, if you see my mobile, I have twenties of topics, mm. and every thing that happens today with me is content itself. Mm. Every every good thing that happens because I never speak about bad things. Mm. I don't want people to really uh, feel any negative vibes and I hate negative vibes. But in principle, uh, content is always there. Mm. It just, you need to understand not only what others want, what you want to speak about. Mm. So yeah, I think that's really important that what you mentioned is, what do I want yes. to, to share and be authentic to myself? Share what you like yeah. as long as you like what you share. Yeah, that's that's the formula that I really follow. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hassan, I heard a couple of things from our discussion today. Um, you know, one that sticks out is when you trust people, they will deliver. Uh, you create a budget for what matters. I really, you know, I really like that. Uh, having it's required that you have confidence to stay positive, uh, or have the confidence to stay positive. Uh, communicate purpose by action. I think a lot of purpose is spoken and not not actioned. And I like what you just said now around uh, by being loud, you're being seen, and when you're seen, people will approach you. Exactly. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to hear you. Uh, I, I think I've been hearing you for some time uh, across different channels, but to actually have the pleasure of sitting with you and sharing this moment was very energetic for me. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And sorry for the delay. I, I mean, we've rescheduled this for a couple of times. But thank you, Tari. I think your questions as well, they reflect the real leadership values that you have. So I always uh, see the value of the host from the type of questions, which were very spontaneous and never prepared. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks. 